Hi everyone, I think you've um, joined us for the first session um, of the Wales and Africa Health Links Network Conference. Um, many of you will have just watched Vaughan Gethin, the Welsh Health Minister, speaking about the importance of um, Wales's role in international health and global health and what we're doing to achieve that. Um, we're absolutely delighted for our second keynote speaker today to be the Minister of Health in um, Zambia. Um, he's joined us today and I can see him on, on screen, which is a relief because sometimes these connections overseas can be kind of difficult to set up. Um, he's been the Health Minister, I believe, since 2016 and is currently overseeing um, the Zambian response to COVID-19. From my understanding, um, the minister recently got COVID himself potentially in June 2020. So we're pleased to see him fit and well with us today. Um, we know that um, Wales's response to COVID-19 has been difficult for many of the people working in the health board. Um, and there's been much coverage of how we expected um, the uh, pandemic to kind of work happen in sub-Saharan Africa and lots of bad news stories at the beginning but what we have been discovering or um, lots of news coverage has told us exactly how well African countries and nations have responded to COVID-19. The preparedness has been remarkable um, we know that's through um, various kind of responsiveness exercises that have happened because of Ebola um, but today I want to hand over the floor to the esteemed minister from um, Zambia to talk to us about um, um, COVID-19. Uh, the sound can be a bit temperamental, so I hope it um, goes well for all of you. Um, I'm going to take the minister off of mute and hopefully it will all go smoothly. I think um, somebody at the minister's end might need to take... Um, yourself off mute on the physical on the physical um, mic. Um, I think you'll need to take your um, uh, take the mute button off of your mic. I think when you physically touched it a couple of minutes ago, you pushed a button on the side potentially. So you might need to push that one again. Okay, okay, we have your, your, your sound now. Thank you. Honourable Minister of Health from Wales, uh, distinguished uh, delegates uh, to the Health uh, for Conference, good afternoon, and I appreciate this rare opportunity for me to share a perspective from Zambia in the fight against COVID-19. My name is I am the Minister of Health for the Republic of Zambia. The Zambian government, under the leadership of His Excellency Dr. Edgar Chagolongo, has been pursuing a transformational agenda in the health sector in order for us to attain universal health coverage. Our broad agenda remains sustainable development towards our vision 2030 but we recognize the need for a healthy population in order for us to be more productive and attain our economic targets. So economic development is inextricably linked to a healthy population. It is for this reason that, this is for this reason that we are re-engineering our health systems to reposition them for universal coverage. Now, shielding the economy from the shocks of epidemics is important. It therefore summons us in the health sector to ensure that the pillar in health system strengthening of health emergencies and health security is strengthened. Put differently, as we reform our health systems, we have pitched health security as a top priority in order to protect the people from health hazards and also to shield the economy from the shocks of epidemics. As we talk about COVID-19, 
we are basically speaking to that fundamental pillar. COVID-19 has been a grave public health emergency. First, a public health emergency, but with disruptive effects on all sectors of our economy. Zambia, under the leadership of His Excellency President, who has embarked on a multi-sectoral whole government approach response to COVID-19, we basically have recognized the importance of stopping COVID-19 at community level. And to attend this, we crafted an eight-point pillar, an eight-pillar response plan. And the first pillar has been surveillance. Surveillance at all points of entry, surveillance at health facilities, surveillance in the communities. Second pillar has been detecting these cases early and managing them. So managing the cases as we detect them has been a fundamental pillar in our response. Infection prevention and control in the community has been very critical. Not only in the community, but at various places where our people intervene. Fourthly, we have focused on the laboratory cluster, the diagnostic cluster, investing in fundamentals to ensure that we are able to diagnose cases early and be able to support the surveillance team as they bring in the more samples. And critically, community engagement and risk communication. We have come up with a robust mechanism to engage the community and to communicate in our risk. This has been extremely important because with community participation, this has helped in uh, the response of early. Stockpiling commodities that we require for the various pillars of the response has been fundamental too. Human capital to provide services across all the pillars, be it at surveillance in at community level or at case management level in the health facilities has been another place where we have placed our resources. And finally, we've been looking at resilience in healthcare, ensuring that routine health services that look at maternal and child health, that look at HIV, AIDS and malaria, and indeed other public health priorities do not suffer as we respond to COVID-19. Zambia started at a very slow pace with COVID-19. We started with only a few cases and we only it only involved international travelers. We began with two cases in March 2020 and this involved only two international travelers. Four months down the line, we noticed an established spread from person to a generalized spread in the community. As we speak today, we have experienced and established a generalized infection in the community. Initially, when the cases involved international travelers and we started following up contact tracing, the cases that we were receiving were very mild. But with time, particularly beginning from June to mid August, we noted a steep rise in cases. We also noted increased severity in disease and positivity among us, the persons that were brought in are dead to our facilities. As we speak today, we have already peaked, plateaued, and we're now getting going downwards, and we've already started easing restrictions. However, we're cautious of a possible resurgence, and so our surveillance is very alert. As at today, 1st October 2020, Zambia has confirmed cumulative number of cases of 14,802, and this is out of 157,213 tests conducted so far. Our recovery has been decent, and 13,961 have recovered. On an unfortunate note, we have lost 332 COVID-19 deaths. We've recorded 332 COVID-19 deaths. When we disaggregate these 111 are COVID-related and 221 are COVID-associated. COVID-19 deaths are 111, while 222, 221 are COVID-19 associated. Now the COVID-19 response in Zambia has been a multi-sectoral one. However, 
we have established the Zambia National Public Health Institute as part of our health system reforms. And this Zambia National Public Health Institute has been the command center for the response to COVID-19. So the COVID-19 in Zambia has been implemented in line with all the hazard emergency preparedness and response plan, which outlines how the multi-sectoral approach to emergency um, responses. Now this plan is only being sustained through partnership with the corporate world, with, corporate, with donors, with individuals who promote the common aspirations of our people. We place premium on partnership. So we set up an emergency catalytic fund as government. And we've seen support from various sovereign nations, from various corporate uh, institutions, and from various uh, cooperating partners. And these have supported us in all the eight pillars. The Public Health Act, that is the overall act that guides implementation of health interventions in Zambia, has been invoked to introduce two statutory instruments that have introduced certain restrictions from inception as we began the fight against COVID-19. However, with the pandemic evolving and the cases reducing, these restrictions have been eased. Where are we today? We have noted that cases have reduced a general term of trend. However, we have not relaxed and we have decided that it is time to ramp up community screening and testing, contact tracing and early case detection. We believe that COVID-19 could be confined to the past if the community up their game in observing the five golden rules where they should mask up, wash their hands, wash in that distance, and ensuring that they avoid crowding and overcrowded places and also reporting cases early. This is the message we have for the public. And so under the leadership of His Excellency President Edgar Chagwa, we have built a coalition of opinion formers in the communities, religious leaders, traditional leaders, and indeed many other stakeholders who've come up with actions to support their constituents in their response against COVID-19. So this whole government, whole of society, partner approach has been in place and a good response has been noted. Coordination has been key in the fight against COVID-19 and the coordination in the country has been at various levels. At national level, we have the National Disaster Management Council of Ministers, which is chaired by our honor the Vice President. And we also have the Mount Sectoral Interministerial Committee of Permanent Secretaries that is chaired by Secretary to Cabinet. And I also chair the National Epidemic Preparedness and Emergency Committee that is a structure that exists um, and is holds meeting quarterly every year and um, is at national and sub-national level. Now the Public Health Emergency Operating Center has been opened at the National Public Health Institute and again this is a platform where we have various players are convened. So this is a coordination mechanism and we think that coordination has been important in the fight against uh, COVID-19. What challenges have we faced in the fight against COVID-19? Public health measures are usually not so easy to execute. Whenever you would want to confine people in a particular place where there's a pop-up of COVID-19, it is difficult uh, to get everyone compliant. So weakness in the enforcement of these public health measures has been uh, a challenge. Uh, some key stakeholders, as you coordinate, may not optimally uh, perform uh, the, their functions, and therefore it's always come become necessary uh, to um, intervene. The financial, so financial inadequacies have been topical and it has been difficult to finance every pillar and therefore we are going to ensure, we are going to ensure, we, we have built a coalition of partners 
in order to ensure that we leverage resources to uh, finance every pillar. As I conclude, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is important to note that epidemics are a major threat to sustainable development. And what is sustainable is for us to agree to invest in stronger health systems that recognize the need for resilient public health security measures that calls for investment in structures that will promote disease intelligence and surveillance. It also involves us investing it also involves us investing strongly in measures that will prevent new epidemics. So public health security is a multi-sectoral responsibility and summons all players in the spirit of health in all policy to ensure that they play their role in enhancing surveillance and disease intelligence. Deliberate investment in health security is critical and sustainable development is inextricably linked to healthier populations which will only be healthier if they are protected through stringent disease intelligence and surveillance measures. I thank you for this opportunity for share, to share Zambia's response uh, to COVID-19. Um, um, we want to be available to take a couple of questions, whether you have those emails now. I'm available to take questions. Thank you. I'm going to read the questions out because people have been sending them in the chat box um, rather than having lots of people coming in about the, um, the conversation. Thank you for giving us so much energy. It is um, fascinating, fascinating and heartening as well to hear that the COVID-19 um, COVID um, disease is part. part. We're hopeful of that too. Um, I'm going to first of all field a question from um, Dr. Catherine Thomas, who is the chair of um, Wales for Africa Health and Internet in more more about your community engagement and risk communication strategy. Um, they have a contact tracing and isolation program for struggling with getting all the COVID-19 to self-isolate. Do you have any insights into how successful it can be? If you could just repeat that question, I think uh, you were a little bit faint at the beginning, so you didn't get the first part of the question. I'll try again. I'll try again. Um, yeah. um, so so it's a question it's from a Dr. Question Catherine Dr. Thomas, who is the chair of the Wales, the Wales and Africa Health, and Health, 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 Health Network. Network. And she, and she is, is interested to know more about your community engagement and risk communication strategies. Um, because it, we have a contact tracing and isolation program, but we're struggling with getting COVID-19 and isolation. Thank you. 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 Thank you is to isolate in identified facilities or cases that were positive and would we'll embark on a contact tracing uh, trajectory to pick up anybody who was uh, in contact with the positive cases. And anybody who was found to be positive, mildly ill or severely ill, would actually be quarantined or managed in our designated facilities. Now, as the numbers swore, we noticed that it was not sustainable to isolate them in designated health facilities. More so that most of the cases were mild cases. We then came up with a model which we called a community isolation model, where those who were found to be positive were counseled to stay home but we are linked to public health experts, case management officers who would actually do some engagement either by phone or do some visits. Now, this 
was a game changer. Because while initially we had two, three, four cases recorded per day, and we could afford to isolate them in our designated isolation facility, when numbers were reaching 100 per day, and we're now spread countrywide, it was difficult to use our facilities to isolate people. And therefore, that would have also taken off balance the routine health services. So we came up with that community isolation model and it worked extremely well because our officers, who are case management officers, were in constant touch with the people at home and they managed to be in touch with them on a daily basis and they managed to pick up those who, uh, who could become sicker and would bring them to facilities. And the outcomes were very good and we did extinguish the pop-ups in a number of uh, places. Secondly, on community engagement, extremely important uh, to use all the platforms to communicate to the public. For Zambia, as part of our health systems reform, We've established a health promotion department that focuses on just crafting messages and delivering them to the public to promote wellness. That department, working with a cluster at the Zambia National Public Health Institute for Communicating Engagement and Risk Communication, has been engaging the public using all media platforms, be it electronic, print media, social media, and they've also been working with our colleagues, the leaders of faith, We've engaged them in meetings and given them key messages to deliver. And uh, our other stakeholders in the health and all policy, like teachers, everybody who has constituents under them, traditional leaders, workplace managers, have all been capacity built with key messages to communicate uh, to the public. But the challenges that were there in the uh, beginning was inadequate space to isolate people. And that's how we came up with the isolation model. The challenges that were there initially in uh, risk communication were, for instance, the cost in printing IEC materials, the cost in buying airtime to engage with the community. And as more partners pulled resources, and as government put in what it could, uh, these uh, were eased, and indeed community engagement and risk uh, communication is a, is a, is a fundamental uh, pillar and a game changer to the whole response. Yeah, and community isolation models did work very well uh, as well. I hope I've uh, responded to that. Thank you very much, very Minister. Minister. Do you have time to answer, answer two more questions? questions? Yes, please. We, we're great, great to have the time. It's a lot on the call. Um, I have another question from um, one of the participants. We said we said um, experienced um, experience some struggles struggle around the revision of appropriate personal protective equipment, equipment in the initial in the response, response to COVID-19. COVID and, and participants would like, would like to know what the experience, experience has been in Zambia um, um, and wondered if the risk health care workers have been developed here in the UK and wondered if the Zambian health care has not feeling the same. Sorry, we did get the question. That's okay, I'll okay, try again. Um, um, so here, so in, the here in the UK, we've experienced, experienced struggles, struggles around the provision of personal, personal protective equipment, equipment in the initial response to COVID-19. We're wondering, we're wondering if the experience is the same in Zambia, and also the risk of healthcare workers has been felt in the UK, and we wonder if the experience of Zambia health has been similar. Provision of personal protective equipment has been one of the top priorities in that response. Uh, looking after the colleagues who are at the front line has been extremely uh, important. And uh, these people at the front line have been those who are doing surveillance at community level or indeed at the point of entry or health facility level. And also um, those who are managing the actual cases in our facilities. 
And so stockpiling PPEs has been a top priority. We started with uh, few, fewer numbers of cases, and so we didn't have a lot of pressure in uh, the hospitals in terms of um, uh, PPEs. And um, we, we, we had fewer cases in terms of you know the, the cases in our hospital facilities, so we didn't have a lot of uh, pressure in terms of providing PPEs. But as the cases swap we noted that we needed a lot more staff in our facilities. We are continuously building capacity in our staff and posting them to our front line. And we needed uh, you know, more PPEs. Um, yes, at some point, you'd find that one or two of the PPEs would actually be running low. We didn't, we didn't run out completely. And uh, our experience, uh, different from the UK, the numbers in the UK were you know, much, much higher, and so we could have dipped in our, in our stocks but never run out completely, uh, but we did recognize the threat to our health workers. And uh, in terms of health worker infection rates, yes, we had a lot of health workers infected. More than 300 health workers were infected uh, in the four, five month period, and they were infected either in the community or uh, right in the you know, health facilities and uh, it had to do a lot with maybe appropriate use of the PPEs and um, in terms of complete stock out of PPEs that we did not uh, experience however it was a very very high cost center uh, to, you know, to, 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 to maintain and ensure that PPEs were available at all uh, levels uh, of the response um, the advantage we may have had was that the geographic spread did not happen uh, in the early past, the first three four months of the, the first three months of the outbreak. And by the time that we are having a generalized geographical spread in the country, we, we had stopped out quite a bit of uh, you know, PPEs. Uh, but I must emphasize that uh, PPEs are very important in protecting health workers at the front line, protecting the community, and also uh, they've been extremely important in maintaining the morale of our staff at the front line. And um, inadequate PPEs could actually be uh, a disaster, could have a disastrous effect, you know, on the response. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll finish the session as we understand your time is precious when you're dealing with um, Ed um, the One more question that we have at the moment is about community response again, I think emulating some interest. Um, we're wondering, in, in the UK, we've had been able to support people financially when they've had their self isolation. Sorry, there's complete distortion. Um, I think the network is uh, failing us here. Uh, we couldn't get the question. And uh, you know, um, could you kindly repeat the question? Uh, our um, network uh, will still be consistent. Yes, I'll try one to go, and if it doesn't work, we'll um, finish the bit so that you can make carry on. Carry on then. Um, the initial passive building in the health facility is impressive. Now that people are isolating the community, it can be to go to the I see. I see. Um, if we got the question right, is that were we supporting those who are in self isolation in the community? Yeah. Okay, so one, uh, one key feature of the response is a uh, you know, social protection. Uh, as restrictions came in, as people were confined to their homes, 
too. As restrictions were imposed, as people were confined to their homes, as people were in self-isolation, matters of survival did arise. We have a huge class of people who survive on the, what they do on a daily basis and um, uh, their livelihoods were disrupted significantly with those restrictions and uh, it was important that we put in an aspect of uh, social mitigation, social protection. So the Disaster Management Unit under the Vice President's Office did come in to support vulnerable communities with some foodstuffs and um, uh, these, this was informed by a vulnerability assessment and uh, you find that a number of people in high density places where we possibly uh, had, where we had higher numbers say in Nakoni, you find that we have to move in to support them with some um, foodstuffs to ensure that they did not starve while they were under those uh, restrictions. But I must comment here that uh, generally the community responded very well and as they were in self-isolation, they generally supported themselves and it was a small, much smaller proportion of the community that benefited from uh, social mitigation uh, measures such as uh, provision of a bit of foodstuffs. The, the social cash transfer uh, program that is part of the social mitigation program for Zambia it was enhanced in certain places where lockdowns were uh, protracted or where restrictions were protracted. We didn't generally lock down, but it was evident that we slowed down in a number of areas in order to keep people home and to disrupt uh, the transmission. Yeah. So social mitigation played an important part of the response uh, to avoid uh, people rebelling because of uh, starvation and other impacts of uh, the uh, restrictions that we had. Well, thank you for the privilege uh, to participate in this uh, uh, very important conference. Uh, truly humbled, and uh, thank you for uh, the uh, audience. Thank you.